But I'd like to begin this morning really just sort of touching with the story um, about a child and his parents. So the story takes place where his parents are sitting down with their child, saying their nightly prayers. And they, they get on their hands and knees, and they go through the list of things that they should be praying for. You know, praying for the kids' teachers, praying for the parents' jobs, praying for um, siblings, family members. And the child omits a certain sibling's name. And the parents sort of respond and say, hey, I, you should really pray for this child. You should pray for your sibling. Why did you omit them? And the child said, I'm not going to pray for them and ask for God to bless them because they hit me earlier today. And the parents do their job as they stood and say, well, good, Jesus teaches us to forgive our enemies. The child immediately responds back with, well, they're not my enemy, they're my sibling, so the rules don't apply. I honestly think this is a great example for some of the challenges that we face, regardless of age. Now, I don't know whether you grew up with siblings or not, like I did, um, but I believe that we have all experienced some sort of frustration towards other people. Perhaps many of us have had the same sort of retaliation and realization that forgiving another, forgiving another person is, is actually really, really hard. Even more so to pray for both our siblings and our enemies when they have hurt us. And I still vividly remember the very, very first time my parents told me to accept my sister's apologies after they tied me to the fence and went inside and to play. It was not easy to forgive them. But, to my surprise, I thought it would be easier growing up. But it wasn't, and I'm sure you can all attest to that. As relationships grow and you become deeper and you become more open to other people, it's even harder to forgive when they hurt you. This is sort of what we're going to be talking about this morning. It's the parable of the unforgiving servant. And it's a reflection that comes from Matthew 28, verses 21 through 35. So I'm going to quickly read this for you guys, and then we will break this down um, through the text. So it starts out as this. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus immediately answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. When the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, please be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. And the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. See, this parable is, again, of the unforgiving servant. And I really want to focus on just a few, a few key points this morning as we make our through the text. And it's, it's going to begin with the phrase, forgiveness is. See, I think this text is really important in dealing with not only forgiveness with those who are of the same faith as us, but with forgiveness of those who are not of the same faith. So the first topic and the first point we're going to actually be hitting today is that forgiveness is not as based on a quantity. The second point is that forgiveness is not, I'm sorry, that forgiveness is based solely on grace. And the third point is that forgiveness is reciprocated unto others. So let's take a look at this text again. Let's go back to this first part to examine really what forgiveness is. The first point I want you to take away this morning is that forgiveness is not based on quantity. This parable starts out after Jesus had just finished, finished speaking with his disciples about what to do when a brother or sister sins against you. And that is what this parable really sort of focuses on. But I believe the lesson behind the parable is applicable to everyone, regardless of whether it's someone within your faith or whether it's not with someone in your faith. At this point, again, it starts out in Matthew 18, 21, and it reads this. 
Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother who sins against me? Up to seven times? Peter addresses this very important dilemma right off the bat. And I think this is still in continual effect today. The issue of how many times should a person forgive one another? Peter's asking this perfect question to, to Jesus since he had just finished telling his disciples what to do when someone sins against you. See, we've all been in this exact same situation that Peter's been in. When someone says something rude, when somebody does something to offend you, or even speaks bad about you in the wrong way to your face or even behind you. These things can learn and lead to hurt feelings, to malice or even a resentment towards the person. You see, Peter's serious inquiry is a question we all ask when someone has done something wrong against us. How wide should my forgiveness be? How many times must I be offended, lied to, tricked, spoken maliciously to, hurt, stolen from, before I say, enough? How long, O oh Lord, before my reservoir of grace runs dry? This is simply a natural question when somebody offends us. One we've all experienced. We all know too well both the small and large ways that people can hurt us and tread upon us. We know all too well that others can take advantage of our generosity, our finances, our time, our emotions, and we know too well the sting of the consistent insults thrown in our direction or the words of malice directed towards us or behind us. But at what point do we say, enough? Peter asked the question we all struggle with. How many times is enough? See, Peter was well-versed in the Jewish law when asking this question. He was well aware that under the Jewish law, a person may not expect forgiveness unless he undergoes a sincere effort to perform what is called tashuva, or tshuva, which simply means repentance, something we all do. So he knew the elements of tashuva, which included a rigorous self-examination that required the perpetrator to engage with the victim. between our friendship and whether our friendship should actually be true. So we think to ourselves the things that we have not only need for them to do to gain our trust, but our forgiveness again. If the situation is even more extreme, maybe even the words, I will never forgive you, come across your mind. But Jesus pushes away from this idea and from this thought. And that brings us to our second point this morning, which forgiveness is based solely on grace. See, when we see in these verses the 10,000 talents, which if you don't know what that's equated to today, is roughly $4 million. So what he owed his master. The servant knew that he had done wrong. His humility and words cry for mercy. And he knew that this amount could never be paid. He knew that no matter how much his effort was, how much he tried, how much he put into his work, he would never have enough. He knew that if he worked the rest of his life, along with his family and sold every possession that he had, that it still not would come close to paying what he owed his master. Yet he does something I think we all do. Instead of apologizing for his actions, he covers it up. He asks for more time. No matter how bad the situation, he thinks that he and believes that he can fix fix this situation himself. We do the same thing unintentionally sometimes. We offend someone and we think, I can do X or Y to make them forgive me and correct it. And even in the worst situations, we see it here. His case was absolutely hopeless, but yet he still tried to fix it himself. The servant knew his whole life was about to be crushed. Yet he begs for more time more patience, hoping for the slightest bit of mercy and compassion. But the king did something else. See, the, the servant didn't ask for forgiveness. He asked for more time. To be patient with him, he would pay back everything he owed, to which he and the king both knew that was impossible. 
but the servant receives something completely out of the norm. Something completely unexpected. He receives something that he did not have to work for, nor that he didn't have to do something for. See, the king showed the servant something so much more than patience. He took pity on him and showed him mercy. And instead of properly punishing his servant for which he clearly deserved, we see a wholesome remission of his sins, of his debts, and letting him go as a free man once more. You see, the king was a man of compassion and grace and saw something much more valuable than 10,000 talents worth. The king knew that even 10,000 talents worth of guilt and debt are counted as nothing compared to the new life of the forgiven sinner. See, we've all experienced this sort of feeling, whether we know it or not. Being forgiven is something we do not deserve, but it's an amazing feeling when we, reserve, when we receive it. Nor is it something that's easily forgotten. So I want to be a little vulnerable with you guys this morning and share um, a moment when that has actually happened to me. So I remember back in college, um, I was in a Christian fraternity at the time. And we used to host these on-campus games. Um, and it was about once a month, and my university had some spoken and even some unspoken rules about things you could do and things you could not do on campus. Um, and one of those rules that you couldn't have any team activities played on campus, um, especially around where the, the school statue was. And so we sort of tried to work around it, and uh, we decided, decided to play a game of capture the flag. We placed one flag in front of the library and one flag on the backside of the student center, as both were ideal locations for flags. It just so happened to be, though, that the, um, the courtyard was right in the dead center of where we placed those flags. And so at one point during the game, I had been pretty skeptical about the game, and I sort of laid back, but I saw an opportunity. And so I grabbed the the flag and started running for dear life. And I passed a few people and headed straight towards the courtyard. I instantly remembered the rules and decided to make an alternative and go around instead. But at that point, I saw some opposition from the opposite team. And the quickest and most logical moment and route at that option was to simply sneak through the courtyard. If I could be careful, it'd be fine, no problem. So I ran alongside the chemistry building which bordered this courtyard, trying to keep out of sight, and out of nowhere, somebody on the other team flies out, crashes not only into me, but continues through me and through the chemistry building window. And it, it, he shattered into pieces. It was everywhere. And my heart sank. At that moment, the game ended, and I knew that we were in some serious trouble. I knew that we deserved some sort of punishment, some fines, some, I don't know, community service, even, even potentially expulsion. And I was going to accept it. Because we directly violated the rules that were placed before us. I knew there was nothing I could do to offer or persuade the the authorities or even the school officials. We waited for the police to arrive, and uh, we expected the worst before them. But like the king to his servant, the police and the school had mercy on us. They not only showed us what grace was, but directly provided a firsthand experience of what that feels like to have grace extended onto you and to be forgiven. They simply let us walk with no repercussions. It was an amazing feeling. I will never forget it. You see, you can't understand what it means to forgive somebody else until you truly understood what it means to be forgiven yourself and the power that is behind grace. See, grace does not mean the embrace of violence perpetrated against us, It does not mean giving free reign to to those who would do us harm. It does not mean an obedience to those who are stronger to us. When truly understanding grace, we must look at our relationship with our Heavenly Father first. We must see that the sum of our offenses against God throughout the years constitutes this similar kind of debt, like that of the servant, an absolutely insurmountable amount. 
in our rebellions, our selfish acts, our thoughts and our willful choices, our lovelessness towards one another, and the hurt that we have caused, our pride, our anger, our lust, our bitterness, our hate, and our lies, all of these things add up through the years to be a staggering debt which we owe God, and we cannot pay. But, like the servant with the king, there comes good news, the wonderful good news of the gospel. There comes a day when we will stand in front of the presence of the Lord and hear him say and pronounce these words, forgiven in Christ's name. The debt we owed him is not, it's not available anymore. It's no longer existing. It's simply wiped away. In one single moment, every single debt that we've owed, every sin we have committed is now gone. Wiped clean. How well we remember as we look back to it, the glory of that moment, when we realize that before God, we stood cleansed, blameless, free. The debt is paid, and we are free. We see this kind of extending grace given out by the king. See, the king understands grace and mercy. He knows that forgiveness is a gift of grace rather than a reflection and of himself. It's a reflection of God's love, not of the curse of abuse or a reflection of our worst tendencies as humans. Just like the King, our Heavenly Father, shows us that grace and forgiveness is something that cannot be earned or even bought. It is simply a gift. See, both our Heavenly Father and the King reflect a level of grace and forgiveness that resembles a deep reservoir of grace that will never run dry. As the king's forgiveness in the parable, the Lord's forgiveness knows no ends, has no constituents or limitations. So our grace and forgiveness with those should resemble that of our relationship with our Father and the grace that we have been given through him. Our forgiveness towards others should be based in our relationship with our Heavenly Father, built on our humility and reminded of the continual grace he shows us even through the sins we commit against one another, and even against the sins we commit against our Heavenly Father. See, forgiveness is, for, is governed by a grace that knows no bounds. This deep reservoir covers all mistakes and all wrongs. But it is only truly once we understand that our ability to forgive is derived from grace and what it means to be forgiven having the full redemption, the full cleansing of the weight of what is doing wrong against one another, that we can go out and extend this grace and reciprocate it to others. That's the final point I want to touch on this morning. Forgiveness is reciprocated and should be reciprocated unto others. There's a saying out there that I'm sure you've all sort of heard. Um, it's, it goes something like, pay it forward. Um, Now, this is more towards the secular world, the world that doesn't necessarily believe in Jesus, but I think it's a very important thought for us as believers as well. If you you haven't heard what that means or heard that expression before, it is essentially um, for when the recipient of an act of kindness does something for someone else rather than simply holding on to themselves, they extend it on to somebody else. We see this occur in the second part of the parable of the unforgiving servant, expressed in verses 28 through 32. So let's take a look at that real quick. It starts like this, But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, which, for those of you who don't know, is about four months of salary. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servants fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me, and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went on and told their master everything that had happened. And the master called the servant in and said, You wicked servant, I canceled all of that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your servant just as I had on you? In his anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back 
all he owed. I think all too often we immediately sort of forget the grace that we have been forgiven. We offend somebody, we've done wrong against them, and they forgive us and we accept it and we're joyful, and then the moment we step out of that situation, we are open to being offended by others' words and actions against us once again. And this is shown by that first servant in the story. See, he completely misses the actions and the deeper meaning behind why he is being forgiven. The servant's attitude was not one of humility, meekness, or even joy. Rather, his mentality is one of how could he still end up on top. The servant's unwillingness to forgive stems from an internal perspective and only focuses on his own well-being instead of extending grace towards others as our Lord Jesus teaches us. Since he was only focusing on his own well-being, he had to ensure his financial abilities. He has to make sure that he gets collected, he gets his money for what people owe him. If this servant had learned and understood how grace truly works, he would have been more forgiving towards his own servant. And as the king forgave him, he should reciprocate that onto his own servants as well. See, paying it forward would have, remembered, would have reminded him to remove his servants' debts as well. There's no need for him to be so demanding of his own fellow servant, but instead of sharing with his friend the joy that he had just experienced from his master, the servant then followed up by mistreating his servant and demanding that the debt be paid for which was owed to him. Just like the servant, we can't possibly fathom an understanding of how to forgive others without realizing first that we have been forgiven through grace by our Heavenly Father. When we can see how we have been forgiven through grace, our inner attitude is changed. It changes from an internal, egocentric, self-enamored perspective to an external, selfless, and heavenly perspective. We reveal the true condition of our hearts by the way we teach others, by the way we treat others. When we take a focus off ourselves and put others first, our hearts no longer carry a grudge when somebody offends us. It no longer seeks justice or to get even to those who have hurt us. And rather than holding everything we can against them, there's an acceptance of the person. A joy is shared with them and an understanding and sympathy that is extended onto them. It permits an honest look at the problem and says, I'm here to help. It's as if to say this, you have hurt me, you have wronged me, you have injured me. And you should suffer the consequences, but despite all of that, I accept you and I can still have a relationship with you. What powerful words. See, our forgiveness is through grace that is extended onto others because we have first experienced what it feels like to be given for the sins that we have committed against our Heavenly Father. That is the first reason that Jesus said we must forgive each other because we have been forgiven so much ourselves. We see this also during Jesus' ministry with his disciples in the book of Matthew, uh, where he teaches them to pray through the Lord's Prayer. He expresses that forgiveness is not only relational, but it's also reciprocal and reliant. See, when he was teaching his disciples to pray, Jesus would have us say, as it says in Matthew 6, forgive our debts as we also forgive our debtors. This fifth petition of the Lord's Prayer is echoed in the lesson of this parable about the kingdom, but reflecting it back in reverse. See, we ought to forgive our king. We ought to forgive as our king has forgiven us. And Jesus says it in answering his disciples' requests for help in praying. Jesus teaches them that not only forgiveness, but he teaches them on how to both give it and receive it. One cannot have it without doing it. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men of their sins, your Father will not forgive you. In answering Peter's request for help and understanding how far forgiveness needs to go, Jesus teaches us that God's forgiveness surpasses both of our deserving and of our comprehension. We who have been forgiven must 
Therefore, and thereupon, forgive those who have wronged us so much more lightly. In conclusion, I, I want to end with this thought. Again and again, we have to understand that our ability to forgive becomes much easier for us to forgive when we forgive others, when we first understand that forgiveness is not numerically based, that there is no quantifiable number or amount of the number of times that we are able to forgive those who hurt against us, and to remember that forgiveness comes from knowing the grace that has been extended to us so that we can extend mercy likewise onto others. Jesus uses parables like the unforgiving servant to remind us of how our debt is canceled, how our sins are wiped clean, and how far the east is from the west that we are forgiven. We are reminded of our debts being canceled through confession and communion, which we'll partake in in just a moment. When we come before him with our guilt, our abandonment, our hatred, with the guilty conscience knowing that we have terribly failed him and sinned against him, we beg for mercy, just as the servant did. We beg for patience, just as the servant did. But he, in return, gives us something so much greater. Not only has our debts been removed that we owe to him, he restores us, he renews us, and reminds us of his deep reservoir of grace, which is never-ending. As we prepare our hearts for communion, um, I actually want us to, to spend a little bit of time in prayer. We're going to end in prayer this morning. Um, will you join me? Most merciful God, we come before you this morning. We're laying some of our struggles with you. Father God, all too often we, the little things can offend us, Father, but... The story of the parable which you told your disciples reminds us that we are called to forgive. We are called to love those who offend us. That there is no number for which we should stop at. Father God, you are a heavenly father who steps before us and wipes us clean when we come humbly before you asking for mercy. The grace you've extended us is insurmountable. And it's something we can never repay, Father. But when we pursue you, Father, it's, it's worth it. Father God, we're reminded of the communion, the last supper which you spent with us. Reminding us of what your call is, what your duty is, and what our call is as followers of you. Let us be just like you filled with mercy, grace, and forgive us unto others. Lord, let us be reminded of the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. But lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.